Coming up on this edition of Impact, a family that farms out of their own home. Every year we're adding more ways to grow more food and we're looking at a, a not complete independence, but as close as we can get. And then an ancient dance ritual. I think it's important for us to share our heritage and roots and culture, uh, not to necessarily to separate them from the mainstream community, but to give them the best of both. But first, a plant that needs a little bit more than just rain and sunshine. They're just unusual. You see the Venus flytrap and you see it moving, and you're, sort of just, you're just a little kid and you wonder about it. Welcome to Impact. I'm Marcus Mulek. Millions of Angelinos have gardens, and feeding their plants is often as simple as a little water and fertilizer. Well, Impact has found some plants whose feeding is just a little bit different. I just like to feed it live. these uh, frozen crickets. They're used for reptiles. And you just sort of drop one in each pitcher, and they uh, They'll just digest it slowly, get in there. It looks like something out of a horror movie, but for Thomas More, growing carnivorous plants is a favorite hobby. Ever since I was little, I've been gardening with my mother and my grandparents. Uh, the carnivorous plants started from um, a biology video they showed in bio class in my high school where uh, they showed about trapping mechanisms of different plants, and after that I just decided to give it a shot. Moore is one of several Californians whose fascination with botany has focused on plants that eat insects. DJ Frank has been growing carnivorous plants since high school. You know, it's hard to really even remember exactly other than um, reading about them, that there were plants that kind of turned the tables and, and ate animals rather than the animals eating the plants. You know, they're just unusual. You see the Venus flytrap and you see it move and you sort of just, you're just a little kid and you wonder about it. Kimo Yap has kept these plants since childhood. He says part of the appeal is having a hobby that's unique. It's kind of nice, especially then, to be doing something odd that not everybody else is doing, in a good way at least. Carnivorous plants gained fame with the 1960 movie Little Shop of Horrors. In the movie, a down-on-his-luck florist buys a mysterious plant that he names Audrey. What's the matter, little plant? Haven't I done everything I could for you? Audrey begins to flourish when he accidentally gives it some of his blood. Eventually, the plant grows to giant proportions, and he must feed it entire humans to satisfy its hunger. Well, goodbye, Dr. Farr. You may have been a crummy dentist, but you were a nice fella. Audrey was designed as a cross between two carnivorous plants, a sticky plant called a butterwort, which catches insects on its leaves, and a Venus flytrap, which works like a mouse trap. There's these three little tiny hairs on each side of the plant, and you just sort of rub across them, and then they close. Venus flytraps are one of the most famous types of carnivorous plants, and DJ Frank says they are often misunderstood. I would say the biggest misconception is people are expecting them to be these huge, monstrous uh, things, you know, and they're disappointed when you show them a Venus flytrap and the trap is, you know, an inch, an inch long. They were expecting something that, that maybe they could stick their hand in and, you know, be like a bear trap or something. Ladybugs. But Venus flytraps are just the tip of the iceberg. A particular favorite for many growers is the pitcher plant, which is renowned for its beauty. This is one of the more dramatic ones called Saracenia leucophila. It's the white trumpet. That's used very often in the florist trade. You'll see that quite frequently in floral bouquets. bouquets. 
Uh, out of all my favorites, it would have to be my uh, North American Pitcher Plant Dana's Delight. It's got this deep reddish pink tinge to it that just covers the entire pitcher and it looks absolutely exquisite in my opinion. Let me see here, like if I were to, for example, clip off this pitcher here and actually cut this leaf, you would think really how many bugs can something like this catch? And yet when I open that up, you can see how effective this plant is at trapping insects. While pitcher plants work by luring small insects inside their sticky chambers, others, such as the sundew, keep their traps on the outside. They get very, very long leaves, and the, if they're grown outside, they would be completely covered with small gnats and fruit flies and things like that. Although the plants may seem intimidating, growers like Frank say anyone can keep them. Yeah, that's kind of a myth. A lot of people think that they're really difficult to grow, and in actuality, they're very easy to grow. You just have to meet certain requirements. Pure water, um, a distilled water, reverse osmosis water, something that removes the, the minerals and the salts. And you need to have a, a potting medium, a soil, that doesn't have a lot of minerals or nutrients in it. You go to the 99 cent store and buy a Venus fly trap. And they have them. And, you know, read up. They're easy to grow, and Moore says their appeal is undeniable. They're, they're weird. There's just something, they're not the average plant that you would have. No one really has carnivorous plants. It's just, it's something that's different. You just sort of sprinkle them over the top. Something lands somewhere. Thank you.